Hello everybody! Hello, my name is Paul. Welcome one and all. Wow, we have a lot to do today. Alex is a busy, busy boy with a lot on his to-do list. First and foremost, to move the plot along, at last, it's time we talk to this gentleman over here, this rather jolly fellow with the really whimsical shoes, which I kind of want. I'm not one to covet people's shoes, but uh, those, yeah, gimme. Excuse me again, sir. You mentioned the princess. I told you I'm not interested in talking to strangers. So what we gotta do is prove our identity. And now that we have our ring back, I believe we can do exactly that. Determined to learn more about the strange man's relationship with the princess, Alexander shows the man his insignia ring and formally introduces himself. I'm sorry to insist, but my name is Alexander of Daventry and I appreciate the offer of the ring, Alexander, but I'm afraid I'm already spoken. Daventry? Where have I heard of Daventry? I love that little neck tick of his. Like, uh, nice. You must be Prince Alexander. Kasima told me about you when she arrived home. How came you here? Why, by a ship, now wrecked upon the sand. But you know Kasima? She truly spoke of me? Yes, yes, I, I saw her briefly when she first returned home. She mentioned a prince to me, a Prince Alexander of Daventry. I'm afraid that was before she was told about her parents' deaths. You see, she arrived home a few weeks too late. The king and queen thought they'd never see her again. It is said they died of heartbreak. I'm afraid she's blamed herself. What a terrible homecoming. If we had only known... <laughs> Terrible indeed, poor thing. Everyone in the kingdom seems to despair with her these days. The streets are silent. Where is she now? The princess is sequestered in mourning. It's a rather dated tradition, and not required, but the wazir says she insisted out of respect. Uh -huh. I see. You've yet to say who you are and how you know the princess. I? Oh, pardon me. My name is Chalo. I am clown to the royal court no, no, no. and have been since the marriage no. of Cosima's parents, King Caliphon and Queen Alaria. Oh, those were the happy days. The pair of them were so full of joy and life, so in love. And Cosima's birth. It would be hard to explain how long they had waited, how they had hoped for a child. I mean, she was such a charming little thing, smart as a whip, kind and sweet. Oh, she means everything to this kingdom, Alexander, and to me. I'm so terribly worried about her. About her grief over her parents, you mean? Well, the truth is, I do not trust the wazir or his plans for Kasima. I'm still living at the castle of the crown as court clown, his clown. But it is more to keep my ear to the ground than out of loyalty. I wish I knew what the princess thinks these days. <sighs> if only I could find Sing Sing, Cosima's pet nightingale. Sure. I might be able to send the princess a message. As it is, sure. I must wait for the end of her seclusion. She needs the time to heal, and she's safe enough in a room, I suppose. The wazir has been warning the guards about some threat to her, some stranger in the land. But I think he's just... Wait a minute! Prince Alexander, you must be the threat he was talking about. Oh, you're in danger. The wizard's genie must have learned of your presence in the land, Prince Alex. Oh, I don't know how, but he must have. I haven't exactly been discreet, I'm afraid. Alexander, this is serious. El Hazred will never let you get close to Kasima now. He stumbled the castle guard, probably to make sure you keep out. Dead suits! Right. Oh, it's too bad there isn't some way to convince Al Hazred that you've left the islands or even died. If he thought you were out of the way, you might be able to get close enough to... Hmm, what an interesting thought. Tell me more about this genie. The genie's name is Shamir Shamazel. Al Hazred brought Shamir with him when he came to this kingdom. Shamir probably won't directly threaten you, but that doesn't mean he isn't dangerous. He can be a terrible trickster and an ingenious spy. <sighs> it's too bad we can't get our hands on Shmir's lamp. If we had that lamp, Al Hazred and all of our problems would be solved. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a fine thing? 
You would wish to be master of such a wicked creature? Oh, Shamir isn't necessarily evil. Genies never are, you know. They only reflect their owner's heart, for good or ill. <laughs> Al Hazred is hardly a shining example for an impressionable genie. Hmm. So how do you propose we go about getting Shamir's lamp? What? Oh, Prince Alex, I was only dreaming. I mean, the lamp is heavily guarded. It would be easier to steal Al Hazred's own trousers while he's wearing them than it would be to get that lamp. But surely a clown's hands are quick and agile. Well, yes, they are, as uh, a matter of fact. But then the theft would be detected almost immediately. And then... Ooh, my poor neck. If the theft were detected. Oh, I see. Yes, well, there might be a slim chance. But only that. If you could find a replica of the genie's lamp, uh, an exact replica, I might be able to make the swap. I alone might get close enough. But I couldn't tell you what to look for. I caught a glimpse of it only once. I would know it if I saw it again, but to say I, I cannot. Well, I'll just have to see what I can do. Good luck to you then, Prince Alex. I uh, really must be going back to the castle. I don't think I'll be able to come back here. If we were spied on, well, it's too high a risk. I hope you understand. If I see Kasima, I'll tell her I saw you. If you do ever make it to the castle, look me up. And do be careful, friend. I will. Goodbye, Jalo. Thanks for all your help. Wow, okay, well Jalo just pretty much dumped everything we need to do in the second half of the game on us right all at once. And I do, while that conversation was going on, and by God, I had a lot of time to think, if... We were having this conversation basically out in the open. Ali's over there. He's kind of checking us out. And the genie, to his own admission, is a master of uh, illusion, disguise, and a master spy. So for all we know, he could be disguised as like a book. Somewhere there's a book here with a glinting eye. And he's going to go back and report it and we're all dead. So Jello gave us two things to do in order to gain access to the castle. First thing we have to do is sort of fake my own death. Or uh, make Alhaz Red think I'm out of the way, like I left or something, I don't know. And then the second thing was, uh, oh yeah, we have to find the uh, genie's lamp. And that's where the lamp guy out there comes into play, but we don't know what the genie's lamp looks like, nor do we have a way to find out unless Jallo could talk to us, but then we won't be able to talk to Jallo again until we go into the castle. So we're going to have to rely on a little bit of uh, fourth wall trickery for this one. But he also mentioned... A little something about finding the Nightingale Sing Sing. So, bam, now we have proof, or at least know, that this is indeed Cosima's Nightingale. Let's see if the uh, speech changes now that we know. But now we can give a bunch of little items to uh, Sing Sang Sung over here. And I think we tried to do this once a couple of parts back, but we didn't know, so yeah, we kind of screwed that up a little bit. So we can give uh, Sing Sing quite a few things. I believe we can give her uh, the ring, we can give her the love poem that fell out of the book, uh, I think a flower at some point. I think we can even give her the dagger so she can defend herself, but that's optional. There's so many, oh, there's so many little optional things you can do in this game, and they all affect the ending that you get. I love it, but I think if we send her the ring first, like, if we send her the love poem now, she'll just think, oh, it's from the vizier, throw it away, go throw it in the lake, and never return to that spot you were at. But, uh, let's give her the ring and see what happens. Please work. Alexander holds out his insignia ring to the nightingale hoping she perhaps is the nightingale that Jallo spoke of Aha. and that she might be able to take the ring to Cosima. The ring is the one thing he has that might alert Cosima to his presence on the Isles. The nightingale swoops down and grabs the ring. She flies off towards the castle, perhaps to Cosima. There we go. Sing, sing. What have you got in your mouth, my pretty? A gold ring? <gasps> sing, sing, where did you get this? Realm of Daventry. But this is Alexander's ring. Oh, my soul, he must be here. Sing, sing, I wish you could tell me what you've seen. Is he really here, then, on this very island? 
Oh, if only I could leave this castle as easily as you. Take this ribbon, Sing Sing. If you know where he is, return it to him. Please be careful, Alexander. <laughs> it is so dangerous, and yet I could not wish you away. I love how she pulls the ribbon from her hair without even looking at it. She just like ninjas it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Sig Sig. Special delivery. <laughs> Do I get my ring back? The little bird makes a delivery. I think my ring is gone for good. Yeah, she keeps it. She keeps it. I think that also is mentioned in the plot later on because it's King's Quest VI and they thought of that. It's a red velvet hair ribbon. Could it be? Could it possibly belong to Cosima herself? Where's the option to sniff it like a creep? The lady's hair ribbon is made of the finest red velvet. A long strand of black hair is caught in the ribbon. That's important. Alexander examines the red ribbon and finds a strand of long black hair. The strand of hair from the red ribbon is the color of midnight. Alexander can only hope that it belongs to his true love. You're making a lot of assumptions about the whole true love thing, but we need a black hair if we turn into the uh, page five of our spell books here. There it is, a skull full of hot oak embers, a strand of pure-hearted maiden's hair. Again, making a lot of assumptions about Cosima's character, but uh, you know, maiden stuck in the castle, pure virtue, heart, 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 all that. We'll come back to that, but what I think should be next on our priority list is the make rain spell. This will be important. We have the salt water because we have the baby's tears, uh, the sacred water we got from the oracle. The falling water, however, we need to make a special trip to a place we have not been yet. And I think now can. And we can't make the magic paint spell until we go to the underworld and go to the river Styx. You think they would find some kind of like a substitute for that? Like, uh, you know, if you could use egg beaters instead of eggs or something, there must be sort of like a river sticks in a can on sale around here somewhere. It's a magical land. Why not? And I'm curious because, oh, damn. Go help my daughter. She needs something to fix her hair. Yes, stepmother. Well, I was going to try and talk to Beauty before she left, but she got yelled at and that was it. Eventually, we will need a rose, but Alexander being the, the virtuous man he is... Alexander has not been invited to pick the family's roses. Technically, they're outside of the property line, so I think you can get away with it. I don't think there's even a court system set up right now, unless they just chop off your head for theft. And you know what? As long as we're here, let's go ahead and dump everything we need to on the bird. Alexander has a love poem from a book in the bookshop. Yeah, let's go ahead and give her the love poem now. I, I, there is an order to these things in order to get things 100%. I hope I remember it. Alexander holds out the love poem, hoping that the bird will deliver it to the same place she took the ring, in the chance that the receiver might truly be Cosima. Why, do you think Al Hazred gave you that ribbon with a lock of flowing maiden's hair? The nightingale swoops down, grabs the love poem, and takes it towards the castle. Sing, sing, my sweet. You bring another present. Let me see. It is a poem, Sing, sing. What was it when I looked at you? What power has chained me through and through? and binds my heart with links so tight I cannot live without the sight of you. Oh, Alexander. I was hoping he'd return to you. Take this to him while he waits. Hurry, my fleet one. Ooh, do I get another poem? Is this one that you wrote, or is there another badly bound book in your room? Thank you. Oh, the service here is great. Uh, I'm over here, Sing Sing, you're- The little uh. bird makes a delivery. I can only imagine trying to play paper boy. It's a note. Dearest Alexander, your time to write this? I cannot believe you are here, my friend. Please, please be careful. Abdul isn't about to let anyone interfere with his plans. Watch out for Abdul's genie, Alexander, and do not do anything rash. I am not without resources, and I will prevail if I can only find some small means of defense. Do nothing to try to get to me. You must not be endangered again for my sake. Greatly in your family's debt, Cosima. Uh, okay. Alexander's hand trembles as he reads the note. 
For the first time in his long search, he has heard her voice again, if only in writing. No words of love, only friendly concern. Friend. Is the maiden merely shy, or does she regard him only as a brother? Oh, so Alexander thinks he's been friend zoned. Oh, let me get your fedora. She did mention that she does need a uh, small amount of defense, so this would be a good time to give her the dagger. The little bird couldn't do anything with something that heavy. Oh, I thought you could do that. Uh, oh, no, no, wait, nope, sorry, getting ahead of myself. I don't think there's anything else that we could send her right now, so we'll come back to this little bird later. And instead, we'll plop ourselves right back on the Isle of the Beast, because uh, we remember that our little f stone archer friend over here, who I forgot to talk to last time. Look here, archer. Do you mind if I pass? The archer retains his stony silence. Do you mind? The stone statue doesn't respond. The rose hedges do not appear to be interested in speaking to Alexander. The wall seems to be fresh out of topics to converse on. All right, you remember we tried to pass through, but the archer is cursed and it's going to kill. I'm not sure if this is the genie or a Hazred's doing, or if this is just one of the island's natural defenses. Uh, because you'll remember there's the boiling pond, there's this thing, and I think there's one other trap we have to worry about before we move too much further. But we did go into the catacombs, we got ourselves a shield, which should do the trick. The otherwise plain wooden shield is embellished with a silver cross. Shield time. Alexander decides to pass through the gate, preparing the shield just in case. The magic arrow completely shatters the shield. Good thing the arrow didn't hit Alexander. You had one shot, bro. You lost it. The archer's bow is empty, his lone arrow spent. He looks so dejected. He looks so sad. Sorry about that arrow, friend. The stone archer looks resigned and does not reply. <laughs> Poor little guy. So now we can actually go through here. and Let's see, what the heck was that gardener actually doing? With the gardener gone, Alexander can see that the garden plot is hardly more than a fresh patch of dirt. He was faking. Alexander has enough trouble without digging around in the dirt for more. Dirt, surrender your secrets. Alexander is greeted with... Ah, whatever. Pretty flowers, though. Alexander walks forward to step onto the gazebo. But the rose hedges on either side of the path, sensing an intruder's presence, reach out their vines and blend together. The path is blocked. Oh, that bush is almost four feet tall. If there's only something we could do about it. The hedge over the path is covered with thorns, and its vines are thick and strong. Alexander cannot part the hedge with his hands. You see, they thought of that too. They said, oh, wait, you can climb over that. Well, it's covered with thorns. King's Quest VI, you, you think of everything. I love you. Alexander takes a magnificent white rose from the rose hedges. There we go. That'll be nice for uh, Cosima. We'll see if she wants that. I don't think there's too much we can do with these hedges. Is there a way that we can chop our way through? How about the dagger? The dagger isn't strong enough to cut through the magical hedges. But it's a plus four. I don't have anything else sharp, nor do I have a magic spell that can do anything with that, so let's move on. We'll remember this is here. And instead, um, it's taking a little bit of a risk, but let's head over to the Island of Mists, where we have not been yet. Another island has appeared on the magic map. Alexander wonders if it has anything to do with the Oracle's reference to the Druids. There's a question mark there, so it was like, to the druids? Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Nope, I'm not even going to do it. From the northeast come the sounds of mysterious drums and chanting. Okay, so we're safe. I, I thought, uh, once you get to the Island of Mists, there is like an instant death that can happen. Uh, but I think you have to go where you're not supposed to go to get caught. I don't know. Alexander is standing on the beach of a shrouded island. From here, two paths lead into the island, one to the northwest and one to the northeast. Weird gnarled trees and rolling mists add to the island's eerie atmosphere. The ocean is only visible for a few feet before it becomes shrouded in mist. I like how you turn your back to it to look at it. It's like, nope, not even looking. The island's trees are gnarled and eerie looking. Grayish moss growing fervently in the damp, sun-blocking mist coats the tree's knobby branches. 
mysterious looking volcanic rocks dot this island. All right, that's enough looking around. So I From think the if you, northeast. Yes, I know. So if I think if you go up in that direction, you do get yourself busted. And I just saved, so that's exactly what we're going to do. Alexander is frozen at the spectacle before him. Robed figures are gathered around a bonfire. Some mystical ceremony is taking place. But as to its purpose, Alexander has no clue. Have you ever seen the Wicker Man? Brothers, look! Uh-oh. Alexander's been seen. I blend in so well with my bright green. This Oop. must be the foreigner we were warned about. How appropriate that he should come during our rain festival. Place him in the sacrificial cage. I believe that's Wait! Tony J as well. I must rescue the princess! No. Nope. There's an ancient druid saying, a man who would save others must first save himself. So we're not sacrificing Alexander you, we're testing you. Alexander pushed into the confining wicker cage. Hoist me up, fellows. Time for my warm bath. The cage is swung out over the bonfire. Oh, that is not a pleasant way to go either. Alexander starts to feel a little warm. And the game knows there's nothing I can do about it, so it's not even giving me control. The bottom of the cage is getting uncomfortably hot. You'll go regally, my friend. Beep. Mercifully, Alexander passes out from the heat before the first tongues of flame ignite the wicker. Yo, weenie. Tickets up. Next. That was a bit too hot to handle. Alexander should have been better prepared. I was about to say, in the in in my defense, that was kind of a not telegraph death. You couldn't really avoid that one, but the game did warn you. It was like, hey, there's a weird drumming coming from that direction. You probably shouldn't go there. So instead, we'll go over here. There we go. From the east come the sounds of mysterious drum. Another reminder: don't go that way. This sort of gives me some unpleasant flashbacks to. Uh, I think we mentioned the silver lining a couple of times. And you have to come over here and talk to the guy of the druids a lot. And you, you spend like an entire chapter of the game here. And I hate it. Hate it so much. But there's a few things that we do need here. Two paths end at a clearing here. A path to the south leads back to the beach. And a path to the east leads inland. Around the clearing is a village of tree houses. A grove of giant trees has been hollowed out to make houses. The trees look cozy and dry, if a bit primitive for Alexander's tastes. Oh, pardon me, your worship. From the east come... Steps lead up to the treehouse's entrance. The steps are sheltered by a worn animal hide. As Alexander peers into the dark entryway, he can make out a well-bolted wooden door. So I think that's the game's way of saying, uh, don't try to get in there, it's locked. What is this little doodad? Nice earrings. A horned animal skull is on display in the center of the village. Based on its central location, it may perhaps serve as ceremonial protection against danger. That's assuming a lot. A communal fire pit occupies a place of honor in the center of the little village. The fire pit, naturally enough, contains coal. Uh -huh. The coals are cold. That's odd, because Alexander definitely smells the smoke of an open fire close by. Hmm, another bit of shadowing. A bearskin hangs on the trunk of one of the tree houses. The coarse brown fur looks warm, if a bit flea bitten. A wooden handled scythe hangs against a bearskin on one of the tree houses. From the east come. All right, so now I think we know everything we need. So we definitely need that scythe for reasons that should be obvious. Ugh. Alexander takes the scythe. I like how it lowers itself just so I can get it. And my spellbook mentions that I need uh, a skull full of hot oak embers. But I think it purposely told me that those coals were cold and won't suit my purposes. But let's try anyway. Let's see if it'll let me. Alexander reaches into the fire pit and takes a lump of coal. Well, I got myself a lump of coal, but well, let me put it in the skull is the question. There's no reason to use that. No, I can't do it that way. Let's see, can I use the skull here? Alexander wouldn't want to dirty that by putting it in the fire pit. Nope, I guess not. The fire pit is as silent as it is cold. All right, yeah, you're really drilling it in that it's cold. The village appears to be deserted. There's no one here to talk to. Hello? 
Is anyone home? There's no reply. Either nobody's home, or the residents aren't in the mood for visitors. Oh, they're looking for visitors, all right. Which begs another question I never really thought about before. The druids are over there kind of preparing their ceremony, but they don't have a sacrifice. So are they just kind of sitting around waiting and hoping that somebody will just kind of pop up and say, oh, there's somebody, grab, put him in the cage, yay, we'll have rain at last. But I believe that's pretty much all we can do the on the island uh, until we come back a little bit better prepared to survive that encounter. So until then, let's take the map and we will head right back to where we were, but now we have a tool specifically designed for chopping shit up. The scythe has a long curved blade and a wooden handle. Time for a little arboreal murder. Alexander wields the scythe, determined to get past the magical rose hedges. The leaves fly as Alexander tries to cut the branches faster than they can grow back together. He sees light. He's through. <laughs> Who dares enter Beast Garden? My name is Alexander. I didn't mean to disturb your private garden. No. And yet, monsieur, you could hardly have accidentally broken through the three enchanted traps of the Isle of the Beast. It is totally the guy who does a Hosred's voice, just kind of... Enchanted traps. <sighs> you must be a prince, then. I know the nature of princes all too well. This face you see before you is hideous, is it not? Well, for the face of a beast, it is really quite noble. Ha! I'm glad you like it, for you will soon own one just like it. I too was once a pretty prince, caring for nothing but adventuring and rescuing fair maidens. But I rankled one too many evil hags. One dark night, I was turned into this obscenity you see before you, warped in shape and trapped on this enchanted island over a hundred years ago. Surely there is a way off this island. Oh, surely. You broke in, did you not? And yet think, where would I go clad so eloquently as I am with this silk and this pelt? You see, my prison is also my sanctuary. You are the first to break through the barriers in lo these many years. That is, except for the druids who stole my heirloom coat of arms. If there's any way I can help... Help? You? I'm afraid you don't understand. The enchanted barriers were a warning and protection for you more than for me. Your prize for forcing your way past them is to join me in this dire life. By the laws of this sorcery, you are doomed to be trapped in the form of a beast. Your reward for broaching this garden is to be my slave, a slave as beastly as I am. You have only a few hours of humanity left. But that's not possible. There must be some way to break the enchantment. Spells always have a weakness somewhere. The enchantment you are under is tied to my own. Oh, the sorceress left me a way out. But I'm afraid it was only her final bitter joke. You see, I need only find a maiden to join me here, to share my castle, my life, willingly. Take another look at me. You can't help but admire the hag's terrible cruelty and cunning. I shall try to find such a maid, for Cosima's sake. Truly? How determined of you. I personally would not waste my last few hours as a man on an impossible errand. However, you may do as you please. I give you this token. It's my family ring, and the only heirloom I have left. If perchance you should... If you think you have found a maid... I shall give her this ring. Yes, she must accept it of her own free will. By doing so, she accepts me. Not that you shall find anyone, mind you. Your time is short. Count the minutes on your fingers while your fingers you have, pretty prince. Your master will await you. 
Okay, well, a pretty little pickle we've got ourselves into now. A pretty little princely pickle, I might say, precociously. Now, there's only one reason that we have to solve the beast's little puzzle in the first place. And by the way, that was not an idle threat. You will transform into a beast. Although I've only seen it maybe once or twice because you've really got to take your time and ignore every possible way to get yourself out of it before anything happens. But the only reason that you need to come here is because of this fountain, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Also, I adore this castle back here. Oh my god, it's so pretty and stately. I love it. This is another place that you can visit, I believe, in um, the Silver Lining, but it's another horrible, horrible, horrible place that you have to actually navigate this hedge maze, and there's a bunch of stuff hidden in there that you need, and... Oh, God, it's absolute murder. I both love and hate the silver lining with such ferocity, but uh, yeah, maybe we'll play it someday. Oh, my. Great gods, did you see that? The man just appeared from nowhere. Perhaps he was sent by the spirits. I see no boat. King Graham? He is an intruder, no matter how he got here. Grab him. Oh, no, King Graham, you've joined the dark side. How'd you get here? Not again. Look, I'll leave. It's no problem. Too late I for think that. not. Let's go. Well, that was awkward. I was just trying to find like a really cool, badass, misty, evil looking place where I could complete my transformation. But uh, <laughs> apparently you can only try and go back to the Druid Island once. Well, this looks like a nice place as any to spend my last few moments as a human. Alexander feels a strange sensation come over him. His skin begins to itch. Uh -oh. His head throbs. There we go, going wee, right back into wee, your... Wee, wee. <laughs> Was that the beast you could do? Oh, I like that... They don't give you the normal death screen for that one because technically you're not dead. You just live out the rest of your life as some sort of boar stegosaurus thing with a really kicky scarf. And this is also a very nice touch because the guy who does the voice of Alexander was also the voice of the Beast in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. So, but he didn't really give us the a really good growl. I feel kind of cheated. But yeah, there it's uh, that's Beast Alexander. <laughs> All right, enough messing around. Oop. So now, if we go back to who we now, well, we assume to be Beauty, she's now hanging out conveniently where we can talk to her. There's a young girl in the yard. The girl is dressed in a long, plain orange robe with a thick headdress. From the appearance of her clothes and from a skittish, fearful look about her, Alexander gets the strong impression that she is a servant, or even worse, a slave. The serving girl appears to be stealing a quiet moment tending the rose bushes. So essentially we just have to find a person who's willing to do anything to get out of the situation they're in and go live forever on a secluded island with a beastly immortal type of guy who has a really cool fountain by the way. Good day maid. My name is Alexander. How do you do? I'm sorry sir, but I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. I had this ring I could show you to prove my... Oh. The girl is too shy and fearful to talk to a stranger, especially a tall, handsome one such as Alexander. Oh, narrator, are you hitting on me? Okay, well, let's go ahead and write down the path of the ring of the beast. Oh. Beast's ring is made of pure, heavy gold and bears an insignia possibly related to Beast's princely past. Well... Apparently rings are just sort of like the de facto passport of the island, so everyone's got their own little signet ring. The rose has a hue of the purest white. Now, I believe in order to get her on your side, she's obviously a big fan of roses, but if we give her this white rose that she's never seen before, like if you give her the Beastly's ring right now, she's like, uh, I don't know this guy, this is kind of weird, I gotta go. But if you give her the white ring, I think she's sufficiently intrigued. Pardon me, maid. I hope you don't think me forward. But I see that you like roses. I thought you might, perhaps, like a fresh white rose. Alexander can see the conflict in the girl's pretty face as she fights between her distrust of him and her desire for the white rose. The rose wins. 
Oh, I shouldn't, sir, but it is so lovely. I've never seen a rose of white. It looks so pale and delicate. Wherever did you find one of such a color? Well, technically, white's the absence of all color, or is it the combination of all colors? They're like magic. Oh, truly? What an adventure that must be to see them. But I should not speak so, especially to a stranger. Thank you for the rose, though. Kind, sir. Maybe I was supposed to give her the rose after the ring? I don't know, but let's give the ring a try. Hey, how about you go live on a place where there's nothing but white roses all the time? Alexander has a thought about the serving girl. He decides to bring up the subject of beast with her. Let me tell you about the place where the white roses grow. The Isle of the Beast is an enchanted place. There's a path running through a deep forest. The path crosses three magic blockades set to keep all visitors away. Well, there were. At the center lives a tremendous beast. Really? Magic blockades? How exciting! What kind of a beast? Is it very terrifying and ferocious? It is a beast that walks on two legs and dresses like a prince. It speaks with the voice of a man. A beast that talks and wears clothes? How is that possible? Is the beast magic too? Not magical. Enchanted. Is there a difference? Beast was once a prince, but a witch trapped him in the form of a beast and set him on the island. There he lives in a castle in the midst of a maze. How terrible! Imagine how lonely he must be. It is a very lonely prospect, isn't it? Oh, You're such an actor. I have met him, you see. So dramatic. He is indeed ferocious, but who would not be? He really exists? Oh, how it breaks my heart. If I could, I would tend to such a beast. Such a beast might find comfort in a kind face. Do you not think it's so? Oh, I think it's so. I very much think it's so. Save me! You would not be afraid of him? Afraid? Maybe at first. But how silly of me to speak so. The roses in this little yard are the only magic I will ever see. I could take you there. In fact, I would owe you my life. If you would go, if you truly wish to go. You are serious? I could leave here? Oh, I have always dreamt of leaving. But to actually go, this is the only home I have ever known. Home is a hard place to leave, even if you're unhappy there. But I will go, if I can help him. I, I must go. Thank you for saving my life. Um, if you could hurry this along, I might change at any moment. I think there is a way. If this takes too long, you will change right here and then. It's on a strict timer. Is there nothing you wish to take with you? There is nothing. Then take this ring. It is his. He will be pleased if you would wear it. Why, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Thank you kindly, sir. Beauty! Where do you think you're going? To a place where roses grow, and to someone who truly needs me. Somehow. Wait a minute. How did- I see you wear my ring. You willingly agree to spend your life here with me? Do you know what that means? Yes, my lord, I do. I have been touched by your story. Pity alone need not sentence you to endure this face. Oh, but it is a gentle face, and kind. You look at me so sweetly and are not repulsed. Oh, by the light of your eyes, my spirit soars! Hey. The enchantment! It is broken! Oh, go back to the way you were. I am pleased to have served you, my lord. Do you still wish me to stay? What? Speak not such nonsense, beauty. Do you think that I learned nothing of true love during my time here? You are my queen. Oh, my clothes! This gown! Is this here? How well it suits your noble heart. Alexander, how can I ever repay you? I have nothing to offer except my gratitude. But please, 
Take these old clothes. Perhaps you'll find someone in need during your travels. You have already repaid me by your example of courage, Beauty. And by your friendship, I hope. You will always have our friendship and loyalty, Prince Alexander. But from a fellow adventurer, take some advice. If you find your true love, protect her with your life. We're all beasts without the redeeming humanity of love. And to aid you, accept my mirror. Now that my life is no longer hung in false shadows, I have no need for it. Give it to someone with nothing to fear from the truth it reveals. Thank you. I wish you both well. Come, Beauty. Let me take you home. I like how her name is literally Beauty. And there's the little salamander down here with the McGlintock eyes who is now wearing the crown. Oh, bye. And you have to wait for him to... Or is it a ferret? Is it a ferret? Maybe a weasel? I, I don't know. Okay, but now we have nothing to fear about turning into a beast. But as long as we're here and never have to make this trip ever, ever again... This constitutes the falling water that's necessary to finish our make rain spell. The lamp is not ready for the fountain water. Uh, okay. Oh, wait. So let's go ahead and pour everything we else need. I think the tears are in there now. Alexander is carrying and the lamp contains baby's tears. Yes. Okay. So the first thing we pour this in there. Alexander pours the contents of the Oracle's vial into the hunter's lamp with the baby's tears. The vial, now empty of its sacred fluid, disintegrates. Excellent, and now... Alexander fills the hunter's lamp to the brim with the fountain water. There we go. Now everything in this lamp should be everything we need for the Make Rain spell. The lamp contains sacred water, baby's tears, and fountain water. Perfection. All right, and that will help us get out of a very sticky situation that you've seen before, but that'll have to wait until next time, where we continue just checking things off Alexander's to-do list to rescue the princess. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, until next time, good night, Jelly Beans. Good night.